So back in 2004, I was a PC gamer and I was there launch day and bought my copy of Half-Life 2 for the PC. The game originally came on 5 CDs, that's right, 5 CDs, and yeah, once you installed everything, you simply couldn't play it, because you'd needed an internet connection and a piece of software called Steam. Back then, I had a terrible internet connection, and this would be mine and many other people's first experience with online DRM. For me, getting Half-Life 2 to even start was painful. Eventually, I would get it running, and of course, the game ended up being a masterpiece. I remember at the time it ran so much better than Doom 3, but it was still quite demanding on my low-spec PC. Valve's new source engine combined with the state-of-the-art physics system built into the game at the time really beat up my poor system. Nonetheless, I dropped everything to low settings and played through the game, and like most of us, absolutely fell in love. So much has been written about Half-Life 2 and how it changed video games forever. In 2005, Valve would release Half-Life 2 for the original Xbox, and this version was so unique and interesting in so many ways. Somehow, Valve managed to fit everything without any cuts at all into the 64 megabytes of unified Xbox memory on a much lower spec CPU. And we're going to understand how this was all done in today's episode. To begin, let's do a quick comparison on specs that were required to run Half-Life 2 in 2004. A minimum requirement on the box was for a 1.2 GHz processor, 256 megabytes of main memory, and for the GPU, you needed a DirectX 7 compatible card. However, this would only get you so far. Recommended was a DX9 compatible GPU with a 2.4 GHz processor. Compare that to the original Xbox, which only had a 733 MHz Celeron processor and 64 megabytes of unified memory, this is a significant reduction. Now, of course, Half-Life 2 these days runs at very high frame rates and resolutions on just about any PC you throw at it, because it is a 2004 game after all. So, wake up, Mr. Freeman. Wake up and smell the ash. Now, if we take a close look at the Xbox version, initial impressions don't look particularly great, especially when you stand idle. Textures appear to be low res, and the frame rate targets 30 FPS, but it has a very difficult time even hitting that number. This, of course, is when there is lots of physics calculations to compute on the CPU, and the 733 MHz processor is surely getting a workout here. Now, the textures in the game are somewhat low resolution, but we have to remember that in 2005 when Half-Life 2 on the Xbox released, it was a different time. Most people were using CRTs, and the game ran at 480i or 480p if you were lucky enough to have a progressive scan television at the time. This level of texturing while today looks very subpar, if we approximate what it would look like on a consumer grade CRT, many of the texturing concerns are simply hidden. And this is how most people would have played the game back in 2005. Of course, over on the PC, the game has been updated over the years to take advantage of modern hardware and modern resolutions, but the Xbox original version was locked in time. And all things considered, I think that it looks quite good. So why did Valve choose to port Half-Life 2 to the original Xbox and release it in 2005, the very same year as the Xbox 360 launch? And why not just go straight to the 360? According to Jay Stelly, the project lead for Half-Life 2 on the Xbox, the Xbox port was in active development for a few years and internally wasn't even considered a port. In fact, it sat side by side with the PC version. Valve would commission Gearbox to bring the original Half-Life 1 to the PlayStation 2. But the Xbox was a different challenge and a strategic move for Valve to bring their source engine to consoles and the original Xbox would be the very first step. The Xbox would be the perfect candidate because it shared similar features to the PC version, including its x86 architecture and of course the DirectX API, which Half-Life 2 was already running on, but the constraints of the CPU and memory on the Xbox would provide a challenge to Valve developers. In its early implementation on the PC, Half-Life 2 would load everything up at the start of a level, and of course for the Xbox this would simply not work. Valve would carefully rewrite the various subsystems in the game to stream data in as needed. 
For example, right before a particular sequence, data would be pulled in, and then once that sequence was done, the data was simply purged. Now, of course, the data streaming technology used was to get around the paltry 64 megabytes of Xbox RAM. And this on-the-fly streaming technology would be something that Valve would ultimately revisit in 2015. The rendering subsystem would also see changes from the PC version. The lighting model in the game was specifically reworked to take advantage of the Xbox hardware using the high dynamic range lighting feature that was available for developers. This would provide a close approximation of the lighting compared to the PC version. Valve would also take full advantage of the Xbox audio hardware. Ironically, the Xbox version has the best audio despite lower sampling because of its built-in hardware audio processing. The Dr. Breen speech at the start of the game sounds absolutely amazing, which really gives you the feeling that you're inside this big echoey room. I thought so much of City 17 that I elected to establish my administration here in the Citadel so thoughtfully provided by our benefit. I've been proud to call City 17 my home. And so, whether you are here to stay or passing through on one. your way to parts unknown, well, it's 17 that I elected to establish my administration here in the Citadel so thoughtfully provided by our benefactors. I've been proud to call City 17 my home. And so, whether you are here to stay or passing through on your way to parts unknown, it sounds quite incredible. Valve would do a lot of work on the audio processing to take advantage of the Dolby 5.1 audio hardware found in the Xbox. The apartment section also has great audio. Listen to the sound traveling through the hallways. It's quite incredible. With all its associated hopes and fears oh, for the future of the I thought you were a cop. Now it's no secret that Half-Life 2 on the Xbox is CPU bound especially with the Havoc physics engine in place, but the entire game is here from start to finish with no real compromises outside of texture reduction and poor frame rate in some areas. As mentioned, in some parts it struggles to keep up, dropping into the low teens and even lower when there is a lot going on. But let's try an interesting experiment. I have a Frentech Xbox, the Dream X model that comes with an upgraded Pentium 3 Tualatin chip that's clocked at 1.4 GHz with real world speeds at around 1.5 GHz. This is also combined with a 128 MB RAM expansion. This is effectively a 2x boost in performance and memory without considering the cache increases as well. So do we actually get a 2x performance in real world tests? and it's easily apparent how much smoother the Frentec Xbox handles the game easing through many of the scripted sequences with a lot of physics going on. This is quite awesome. Check out this early part of the game when you go outside the first time. This also shows the improvement. It's quite awesome to see this, and I have to be honest with you guys, this is actually the first time I've booted up Half-Life 2 on my friend tech. And that brings us to an interesting point. Half-Life 2 released in 2005, as we said. 
but many people overlooked the release because they had their eyes set on the Xbox 360 that was launching later that year. While other people tell me that they didn't even know Half-Life 2 even existed on the original Xbox. And that really is a shame, because Half-Life 2 on the original Xbox for me is one of those impossible ports, one of those killer apps that I feel strongly about if it released in 2004 with the launch of the game, it would have sold much, much more. But even still, it was a very important release for Valve that set their ways on console development and bringing the Source engine to consoles and continued to iterate upon it with the release of the Orange Box on the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 just a few years later. And I believe if you are a fan of the original Xbox and Half-Life 2, you should do yourself a favor and take a look at this release. Of course, it is dated, there definitely are performance issues as mentioned, but this is one of the most unique and interesting ports I've ever seen. What Valve had managed to pull off with only 64 megabytes of memory and a 733 megahertz processor is nothing short of incredible. And I do want to stress that even though the game still has its issues, I think it's one of the best games on the original Xbox. But we are going to leave it here for today's episode. Let me know your experiences with Half-Life 2 on the Xbox. Did you even know the game existed? Did you play the game? I definitely want to hear what you guys have to say. But for now, we are going to leave it here for this episode. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked it, please don't forget to leave me a thumbs up. And I'll catch you guys in the next episode. Bye for now.